Daily Minutes podcast number 1617 with today's podcast, 12 May 2019. This is our bulletin of Sunday. Today's podcast will be completely in English. Did you hear our new intro music? It's a French artist called Blasco and the number is called Incoming. The song is published under a Creative Commons license. Today's show uh, was partly prepared yesterday when I became a uh, huge computer problems around 15 minutes before 7 o'clock uh, our deadline. It took me almost all evening to get uh, only a grip of the situation and I'm not sure whether I actually did solve the problems or not right now. Today we have the ARRL news and in addition to that on our VK6 FLAB's foundations column. After that we have an episode of The Doctor Is In uh, which is about time also from the ARRL. This is ARRL Audio News, your weekly summary of news highlights from the world of amateur radio. If you retransmit audio news through a repeater, listen for the Morse code K character, followed by four seconds of silence. That's your cue to stop transmitting so that your repeater timer can reset. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, and these are stories for Friday, May 10th. A recent article in the New York Times reported that many garage door openers and keyless vehicle entry fobs in an Ohio town near Cleveland had mysteriously stopped working. While the article invoked the X-Files and hinted initially that a NASA research center somehow could be involved, the case was not so much mystifying as arcane. More than a dozen residents reported intermittent issues getting their key fobs and garage door openers to operate, and most lived within a few blocks of each other. At one point, the local power utility started shutting off power to areas where the strongest RF signal was detected, but the signal persisted. Dan D'Alessandro, WB8ZQH, a TV technician, was among several hams who investigated. He initially picked up little blips on a signal detector, but finally, on one block and at a particular house, the signal was quite loud. The source of the problem was a homebrew, battery-operated device designed by a local resident to alert him if someone was upstairs when he was working in his basement, the Times reported. It did so by turning off a light. The individual who, the article said, has special needs was not identified for privacy concerns. The inventor, who had no malicious intent, had no inkling that his device was wreaking havoc on the neighborhood until a North Olmsted City Council member and a volunteer knocked on his door. The device operated on 315 megahertz, the frequency many keyless entry devices use under FCC Part 15 rules. The device's battery was removed, the signal stopped, and all who were involved breathed sighs of relief. ARRL Field Day is June 22nd and 23rd, and the Field Day site locator is now up and running on the web at www.arrl.org forward slash field dash day dash locator. There are more than 430 field day sites in the locator so far. To find a field day site near you, enter your town and state in the location or call sign box at the upper left. Listings also are available by state or Canadian province. To add a site, visit the Add Field Day Station page at www.arrl.org forward slash field underscore days forward slash add. Visit the Field Day social media page for information on promoting your Field Day operation via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If you're heading to Dayton Hamvention this month and you're equipped with a smartphone, you'll want to download the new ARRL Hamvention app. The app is a collaborative effort between ARRL and Dayton Hamvention. ARRL Convention and Event Coordinator Eric Casey, KC2ERC, has been getting the app ready. Casey said, quote, Our goal is to have all of the printed program content mirrored in the app, organized so that you can schedule the forums you're planning to attend and find the exhibitors you want to visit, unquote. In addition to including exhibits and forums, the app will highlight schedules and details for affiliated events, such as dinners and other special gatherings, and a feature to allow attendees to follow the hourly prize drawings from wherever they are. The Dayton Hamvention Prize Committee will populate the app as winners are drawn. Attendees are also encouraged to tap on the My Profile icon 
to optionally include their name and call sign, email address, and any other information they'd like to share with other attendees. The free 2019 Dayton Hambenchen event app is available for both Apple and Android devices. Former ARRL headquarters staffer and life member Ellen White, W1YL, is the sole U.S. radio amateur to be awarded the Russian E.T. Krenkel Medal this year, a prestigious award granted to individuals and organizations for outstanding global contributions to amateur radio. In 2018, QST Magazine was awarded a Krenkel Medal. First licensed in 1946, White had already learned Morse code in high school, and even today, she only rarely operates on any other mode. She served for more than 25 years on the ARRL headquarters staff, at one point as contest branch manager. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. It would not be the 50th anniversary of AMSAT without a little trip down memory lane. Exactly what was going on during the past 50 years? Going backwards, in May 2013, NASA announces AMSAT FOX-1 launch date for 2014. The satellite has an orbit that will last about 11 years. In the Apogee View, President Barry Baines, WD4ASW, explains AMSAT's vision to offer other CubeSat builders, such as universities, the ability to partner and fly a scientific payload. Moving back to 2009, the talk was about SuitSat 2, and Owen Garriott, W5KWQ, was the guest speaker at the AMSAT Taper Banquet in Dayton. Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, was presented the ARRL President's Award for making amateur radio present in NASA-sponsored activities such as the Space Shuttle, the Mir, and the ISS. Way back to 1999, the Russians were going to launch a satellite for Swatch. That was scrapped. UFSAT-12, or Oscar-36 as it was called, was successfully launched and put in orbit in April. In 1985, the Soviet RS-9 and RS-10 satellites were scheduled to launch. They would operate in Mode A and Mode K. Oh, what fun that was. I remember working RS-10 in the early 90s. And finally, in March of 1980, the millennia orbit was discussed. You would have up to 15 hours of use from the satellite. This was the orbit for AO10, AO13, and AO40. Speaking of rag chewing, there was no problem with this orbit, and it was a lot of fun. More to come in future reports. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, for the ARRL Audio News. This is the ARRL Audio News Propagation Forecast for Friday, May 10th. We have two spots on the sun this week, but these are cycle 24 spots. Even so, they've boosted the solar flux index up to 75, so expect some band openings as high as 15 meters. One of the spots unleashed a minor flare a few days ago, but it wasn't directed at the Earth. We can expect some disruptions on the HF bands over the next few days due to the usual solar wind. On VHF and UHF, it looks like 6-meter sporadic E season has begun. We've received reports of band openings, and a few have been strong enough to support communications over about 1,000 miles. If you're an FT8 operator, this is the time to park your radio on 50.313 MHz, And for SSB, keep an ear to 50.125. And that concludes ARRL Audio News for this week. Our thanks to all contributors to this week's report. ARRL Audio News is produced by the American Radio Relay League, the National Association for Amateur Radio. For more information on amateur radio or the ARRL, visit us on the web at ARRL.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for ARRL. If you have a question or comment about ARRL Audio News, email us at audionews at ARRL.org. This program is copyright ARRL, all rights reserved. 73, and thanks for listening. Foundations of Amateur Radio If you measure the voltage at the base of an antenna and record the readings, you end up with a collection of numbers that represent the voltage over time. These numbers, or samples, can be used to represent the antenna signal inside a computer. 
An antenna system voltage is an example of an analog signal, continuous over time. The recorded readings, the samples, are an example of digital, discrete and intermittent. It's possible to reconstruct an analog signal from digital samples, and that's exactly what Software Defined Radio, or SDR, is all about. The process of sampling essentially converts a continuous signal into an intermittent one. As recording separate samples implies, there is loss of information in this conversion. For example, if you sample once a minute, you'd represent a continuous signal as 60 samples per hour, probably enough to reconstruct where you've driven in your car along the highway, but hardly enough to reconstruct the route through the middle of the city, let alone represent an antenna signal that varies millions of times per second. So how often do you need to record a sample? Turns out, that if you sample at least twice as fast as the highest frequency you're representing, you're good to go. So, for sound, the human ear can hear about 20 kHz, so more than twice that explains some of why a CD is sampled at 44 kHz. If you want to represent the 20 meter band up to 14.350 MHz, you need at least a sample rate that's double that, or 28.7 MHz. As an aside, there are other ways to look at this problem. If you manage to move the 20 meter band down to zero, then you'd only need at least a sample rate of 700 kHz to do this. Let me say that in a different way. The width of the 20 meter band is 350 kHz, so sampling it would require at least twice that, or at least 700 kHz. Moving frequencies around is something that we've been doing in traditional radios for a long time. The technique uses one or more frequency mixers. This means that combining some traditional radio tools with an SDR gives you even more options. Truth be told, however, this idea of moving the band with one or more mixers is becoming less important as technology improves, and there are plenty of reasons not to use this. I'll talk about that at another time. So the first takeaway is that to sample a continuous signal and be able to represent that signal accurately requires a sample rate that's at least twice as high as the highest frequency in the continuous signal. Without going into the actual proof of this, consider a sine wave that oscillates at 1 Hz. If you sample it at anything less than 2 Hz, you'll end up with some cycles being sampled only once, which is not enough to represent the sine wave. If you sample it at exactly 2 Hz, you'll have two samples on every cycle, but if you happen to sample when your signal is at zero, all you'll ever measure is zero. By sampling at a rate greater than 2 Hz, you overcome that limitation. I'll make brief mention of another phenomenon, that of oversampling. An interesting thing happens if you sample twice, three times or more than the minimum sample rate. In short, the higher sample rate improves the dynamic range, noise performance and filtering, all very useful when you're processing radio signals. Cheaper and cheaper hardware are making this very attractive and it explains some of the reasons why SDR manufacturers are using sample rates that far exceed double the highest frequency being sampled. For example, the Flex 6600 samples at 245.76 mega samples per second, or MSPS, even though the maximum receive frequency is between 30 kHz and 54 MHz. In case you're wondering, yes, I'm leaving out a lot of detail here, one thing at a time. The opposite, undersampling, has its uses as well, but I'll also leave those for another time. The second takeaway is that higher sample rates are used to reduce cost, increase performance, and reduce component count. Some of what I've talked about can be explored with the popular RTL SDR USB dongle, which is actually a mass-produced commodity digital television receiver made in the millions and accessed directly thanks to the combined efforts of many different people. If you'd like to start to play, $25 should get you a dongle 
and most of the software you can start to experiment with is free. Check out rtl-sdr.com to get started. If you'd like to get in touch, please do. CQ at vk6flab.com. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. This is The Doctor Is In, your bi-weekly podcast that discusses all things technical and not so technical. The Doctor Is In podcast is produced by ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and sponsored by DX Engineering, helping you shrink the globe. See their website at www.dxengineering.com. And now, here's your host, QST editor Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and the doctor himself, Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Hello and welcome to The Doctor Is In. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY. And I'm Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Joel, it's time to talk about time. All right. Well, uh, well, should we say universal coordinated time, UTC, or can I mangle French here? Sure, why not? All of our French language speaking listeners, please cover your ears at this moment. It, it All I get is temps. That, that can't be right. Temps universel coordonnon? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pass on that one. <laughs> or I, I I could do it as my, my father would have done it, you know. Temps universel coordonone, you know, but no. UTC, Coordinated Universal Time, which is uh, the basis of all logging and many other things at amateur radio and in many other industries, too. Absolutely. And, um, it, it is the abbreviation for coordinated universal time with the sequence of letters as um, written in French because it's an ITU standard and they do that in Switzerland and um, they speak French in that part of Switzerland, I guess. It's it's functionally identical to what we used to call Greenwich Mean Time and uh, in the military we used to call it Zulu Time, both used for many years. They may still use them in some places. And this is the the time at the prime meridian, zero degrees of azimuth, which runs through Greenwich, England, just across the Thames from downtown London. I've been there. Me too. And home of the British Naval Observatory, which is now a museum. And that defined GMT as the world standard going back at least 300 years. Yeah. And um, that was before radio, of course. But it wasn't before navigation, and the British, of course, were very big on navigating and ruling the world and all that. The sun never set on the British Empire. That's right, or the daughter. But it is also the home of the Cuddy Sark, one of the last and perhaps the fastest tea clipper ship, circa 1869. And that's uh, open for visiting also and worth a trip if you're worth a visit if you're in the neighborhood. I think at, uh, at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, if I recall correctly, they have the meridian in, uh, there's a marker in the floor of where the prime meridian is, ah. where zero, you know, goes through there. Right. Zero longitude, I should say. Yeah, yeah it's um, it's a big deal for navigation because if you know what time it is in Greenwich and then you're on a ship someplace east or west of there and you see what time the local noon is where the sun is directly overhead, the difference in the time is, uh, you know, it's 24 hours to go all the way around the uh, 360 degrees. So the, the whatever fraction of that uh, difference in the time you have is the amount you're uh, east or west of the meridian. So makes navigation very easy. In fact, I read a book some time back um, called Sailing Around the World Alone by a guy who built his own boat in 1890 or something, 30-foot uh, sloop, trying to escape his wife, which worked. <laughs> and uh, he sailed around the world. His only navigating instrument was an alarm, wind-up alarm clock with just an hour hand. <laughs> and he used that to navigate all the way around the world. So he was mainly going east and west, although he had to go north and south in places too. Yes. Very, uh, very interesting story and lots of interesting things he ran into. The process. Now, UTC, of course, in amateur radio is extremely important. I know a lot of new hams have never heard of the concept of universal coordinated time, of having one time you know, like in the Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all. One one time to be the standard for the entire world. So it, it's a, this is not a podcast devoted to new hams, obviously, but still it's a new concept for them to, to grasp. That's right. Even some experienced hams who tend to talk locally, 
may not encounter this, but everything you do in terms of um, QSLing or, or confirming contacts and stuff, it only works if the times are the same. You go put something yes. in the logbook of the world, it has to be within so many minutes of, of uh, when the other person put it in. And if you have the day wrong because you're on the other side of the date line or you have the uh, time wrong, it's not going to work. And you put it on a QSL card, it's not going to show up in the guy's log because most guys keep their logs in uh, UTC, as I do. I have a clock at my station that uh, is in UTC. In fact, my computer clock is set up so it shows both local and UTC time, which is very handy. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, you bring up a good point about QSLs, uh, and this is part of that same concept that's hard for some hams to get their minds around. And it's, you know, not only used by radio, but... um, it was used for hundreds of years in the train service, other kinds of transportation kind of things in Europe. They cross uh, date lines and timelines, not date lines so much, but uh, time zones frequently. They had trains running every which way. It's interesting. In, in fact, you'd think that um, UTC or Greenwich Mean Time would be the time that they use in England, but they don't. Of course, they use no. <laughs> Central European time, which is the time in Central Europe because the commerce is all kind of coordinated with uh, the Europeans. So they, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if, if UTC is, is actually used as a time any place, probably someplace. It could be. I mean, I know that when I was in London, one of the things that I had to get used to was the fact that the British pressed their time using the 24-hour right. format. And so if they said, oh, we're having dinner at 1800, I had to think quickly, let's see now. What what time is that in terms of what I'm used to? Oh, six o'clock at night. Okay, got it. Yeah. Exactly. But that, 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 well, I guess that's easy for me. I guess having been in the military, they use that all the time. But anyway, it is the time. And that's one aspect of of time. The other aspect of time to think about is um, the timing of digital mode communication itself. Some digital communication can be referred to as synchronous or time synchronous in that they look for signals only at certain times or certain parts of each minute, for example. And uh, the the extreme of that is is bit synchronous communication in which there's actually a clock pulse sent along with the signal or derived from the signal in some cases. And uh, you only look for a signal during, let's say, the leading edge of that clock pulse. And that has a lot of advantages because it avoids the problem of you trying to decide whether that was a signal or noise during some interval that there wouldn't have been a signal anyway. So you just look during that time and it's usually much clearer whether you have a signal or not. The digital modes that we use, I think, I don't think any of them are a bit synchronous in that sense. No. But they're fairly synchronous in terms of the fraction of the minute that we're in. And I'm not sure what the threshold is on FT8, for example, but it's some small number of seconds. Yeah. In fact, uh, my experience with FT8 has been that if my computer clock is out of sync or if the other station's computer clock is out of sync, by more than two seconds, I won't be able to decode his signal. And, and it's you know it's even worse than it sounds because... What it means is when you look, it looks like there's nobody there because everybody That's else right. is on the right time. So so you're just not getting anything. You say, oh, the band's dead again, or I should go out and collect stamps or something. <laughs> but but really what's happening is your clock is off. And yes. it's important um, if you're, you know, all these modes are decoded by computer. It's important that your computer's clock, the Windows clock, if you're on Windows, be synchronized to UTC. And there are a number of ways of doing that. But uh, there is a mechanism in the computer that allows you to synchronize to a uh, time server. And uh, the best one is the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, which are WWV. There are a couple of servers that do that. You can click on them yes. in your clock settings menu. You have to go in a couple layers deep. I have that actually set up on my desktop so I can go right to it. And if I'm going to do anything with digital modes, I before I do anything else, I sync up. Even though you can set it for automatic, but I'm never comfortable with that because I don't know when it thought it was a good idea to do that. And different, exactly. com- different computers have different uh, drift rates and so forth. Windows, I think, tends to only do it, uh, and I'm not an expert when it comes to this aspect of Windows, but maybe just a couple of times a day, maybe only once it's initially yeah. turned on. And the computer could drift enough that that can be problematic, sure. Absolutely. So so just to be safe, whenever, before I start a session, I synchronize then. I hope that, you know, it'll last long, as long as my attention span. <laughs> Now, there are some software clients that you can install, and they kind of run in the background, and they keep synchronizing on a, on a frequent basis. I know one popular one uh, for Windows was called Dimension 4. That's still out there. If you Google that, 
Uh, the one that I use is called NTP, Nancy Tango Papa, and uh, that's at a website called Meinberg, M-E-I-N-B-E-R-G, if you, if you Google that. Uh, that's worked very well for me. Again, it runs in the background. You don't even know it's there, but I know it's there because when I'm operating FT8, pretty consistently, I see that I'm within about a tenth of a second of all the stations that I'm seeing. Unless, of course, they're out of sync. I don't, nothing I can do about that. But. Well, there are usually enough stations out there that you can tell whether it's you or them. <laughs> yeah, well, they, exactly, yeah. And also, if you really want to get into it, uh, you can attach a small GPS receiver to All your right. computer and be synchronizing with their clocks, their yep. rubidium clocks on the satellites. The little GPS receivers are down to, I think, what, 15 bucks on Amazon, something mm -hmm. like that. And then there's a piece of software. It's called, uh, I'll try to spell it out, but it's N-M-E-A-Time-2, numeral two, uh, all one word. And uh, if you Google that, you'll find it. And what it does is that it takes the time information from the GPS receiver, and then it syncs your computer to it. Then your computer is hyper, hyper accurate. But that's a little farther yeah. than I need to go. But Yeah, well, it doesn't hurt to be more accurate than you need to be, but it does hurt to be less accurate than you need to be. <laughs> yes, that's true. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, Joel, let's hear from DX Engineering, and we'll be back. All right, I'll be here. Our fellow hams have told us how much they love receiving the DX Engineering catalog. It's 132 pages of amateur radio heaven, packed with competitively priced equipment. You'll find everything from multiband Yagis to whip antennas, the latest bass transceivers to mobile radios, and every accessory under the sun. But the catalog only represents a small part of what DX Engineering offers. When you visit DXEngineering.com, you'll find thousands of items from trusted names like ICOM, Yesu, Kenwood, and Alinko. There's world-famous antennas from OptiBeam, E-Antennas, and M-Squared, Roan and American Towers, plus many more. And shop a wide selection of innovative DX Engineering brand products. They're designed and manufactured by our team of amateur radio enthusiasts for hams just like you. Plus, you get the fastest shipping in the ham universe, and shipping is free on most orders over $99. Experience ham radio heaven at dxengineering.com. That's dxengineering.com. And we're back, Joel. And I have a question from Michael, WB7WEA, and he's asking an article by Michael Sapp, WA3TTS, in the April 2019 antenna issue of QSD, describes the U, the EWE, that describes, of course, the shape of the antenna, the U. Uh, a web search comes up with several descriptions of the antenna, dimensions, tuning, and other details, but it's always discussed as a receive-only antenna. Why can't this be used as a transmitting antenna? Perfectly good question. It is a logical question, and um, I suppose you actually could transmit with an antenna like that. Anything you can receive from, you can transmit from. But the idea of this class of an antenna, which includes a number of other ones going back to the beverage, perhaps the first in this group, which was patented by Harold Beverage, W2BML, in 1921, is that they're very directional such that they uh, can focus on this desired signal. Uh, the beverage is just a long wire and it receives essentially off the end, but it also receives other signals which don't combine as well and, and um, signals and noise tend to be uh, reduced, whereas the desired signal is enhanced by the nature of the antenna. So what it does is it gives you a better signal to noise ratio on receive than the typical antenna, but it's very inefficient. You get a very small percentage of the signal you'd get from some other antenna. So you have a choice. You can use an antenna like your transmit antenna might give you a very good receive level, but the problem is the noise and interference will be much higher and you won't be able to copy it. With a receive-only low noise antenna, you have a much weaker signal, but the signal-to-noise ratio is better. So you need to crank it up or have an additional preamp to use it. So what it means is that the efficiency on receive is a couple of percent to perhaps up to five or 10 percent, depending on the nature of the antenna, but the signal noise ratio is much better. Now, if you were to transmit through this, of course, you'd have to make the components yes. large enough so they could handle the transmit power, but most of them are fairly straightforward and it wouldn't be a problem. Preamp probably doesn't work well backwards, but you got to <laughs> switch that out. Put a hundred watts into it. Yeah. yeah. Once. <laughs> <laughs> Once. So you could transmit into it, but the signal that goes where you want it, where the other station is, will be at 1 or 5 percent or 10 percent. So if you have 100 watts going out, it gets received at the other end as if it were a 1 watt or a 5 or 10 watt 
uh, transmitter. And the problem is the station at the other end doesn't have the benefit of improved signal noise ratio. So he has the same noise, but your signal is now down 20 or 30 decibels, and he can't hear you at all. <laughs> so that's the problem with using it on transmit. Well, that's no good. So that's why the these receive-only antennas are used just for receive, not because they couldn't be used for transmitting, but because they don't transmit very well. <laughs> I always knew there was a reason for that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joel. My pleasure. If you have a question for the doctor, email us at doctor at ARRL.org. The Doctor is In podcast is sponsored by DX Engineering at www.dxengineering.com. Background music provided by Purple Planet at www.purple-planet.com. This podcast is copyright ARRL. All rights are reserved. Until next time, I'm QST Managing Editor Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY73, and thanks for listening. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending www.pa0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70 mhzshop.nl. Whoever hears this is crazy. En microfoon naar het toer. Abonneer je nu op de podcast van de Daily Minutes. De website van de podcast is dmpodcast.net. DM is kort voor Daily Minutes, dus dmpodcast.net. Bij de feed van de podcast komen er nog een breukstreep en vier letters bij. Breukstreep F-E-E-D. dmpodcast.net, schuine streep F-E-E-D. Subscribe now for this podcast, dmpodcast.net slash feed. dmpodcast.net slash feed. DM is Delta Mike.